Hi, I'm Melissa Carney, Professor of Economics at the University of Maryland, and I'm the Director of the Aspen Economic Strategy Group. And I'm Philip Levine, Professor of Economics at Wellesley College, and we're here to answer a few questions about our paper, The Causes and Consequences of Declining U.S. Fertility. This paper is part of the Aspen Economic Strategy Group's annual policy volume, Economic Policy in a More Uncertain World, which is set to be released in December of 2022. The fertility rate, meaning the number of births per women of childbearing age in the US, has been steadily declining since 2007. Now we would have expected a drop after the Great Recession, but the surprising thing was that it never bounced back up. And so this continued decline for a number of years has resulted in a situation where now the total fertility rate, which is the expected number of children a typical woman in the US will have over her lifetime, is substantially below two. And that matters because that's below replacement level fertility, which means slower population growth. Uh, interestingly, there's been some groups that have had particularly large declines in their fertility rates in the US, namely teenage women and Hispanic women. But for the most part, this decline in fertility rates has been very widespread. Essentially all five-year age groups under the age of 30 are having fewer births, both women with less than a high school degree and women with a college degree are having fewer births in the past. So it's really a widespread phenomenon. Um, the other thing that I think is important to realize is that the fertility decline that we've been experiencing in the US happened in other high income countries, many in Europe and even in Asia in the 80s and 90s. So those countries have been living with below replacement level fertility for a number of years now. So it, it could be the case that the reason why uh, births are falling is just sort of pure demographics, like you know, changing population composition of women of childbearing age. Um, older women would certainly contribute to that. Um, it also could be the, the fact that there's like a you know a few groups that are changing um, their behavior, but you know it really is neither of those things. These are these are very broad, widespread patterns across you know several groups uh, of women of childbearing age. All of that is contributing to the decline. Um, and the other thing that we see in the data is it's not just the case that, you know, it's just, well, women are having babies at 30 instead of at, you know, 20 or 25, you know, that would catch up at some point, but it doesn't really seem like that's happening either. It seems much more like, you know, as more recent cohorts come along, more recent generations of women go through childbearing age, uh, they're having fewer babies throughout. So climate change, I would consider it to be in the category of completely plausible explanations of things that are changing in the world that could be contributing um, to the decline in births. So, you know, if people are more concerned about the climate, they may be having uh, fewer children. Um, but there's other things, other uh, plausible explanations in the same category. So rising housing costs, uh, increased costs of childcare, uh, improved contraceptive technology, that may be the case that women have greater economic opportunities. And as the world is changing in those ways, uh, women are responding to those changes and families are responding to those changes by having fewer children. Uh, that doesn't really seem like it's supported by the evidence though. And one way that we can look at that is by comparing patterns across states. Though is it the case, you know, for instance, um, where housing costs are rising, states where housing costs are rising the most, is that where child uh, childbearing is falling the most, uh, and the answer to that is no. And that's true for a whole host of completely plausible potential explanations, including greater concerns about uh, climate change. So it, it seems like this is not about some world event that's taking place that's generating the changes in behavior. It seems like, again, it's much more about as newer cohorts, more recent generations come along and move through childbearing age, they're just acting differently. Uh, well, the first thing that I would say is that in, just in general, econo uh, economics is concerned with um, you know, human behavior and what are the sorts of uh, circumstances and conditions that, that determine what people do. Uh, fertility certainly is an explanation, is an example of that. Um, 
more broadly though, there certainly is the possibility of broader impacts. Um, I, I would say that the most direct example of that is its impact on uh, social insurance programs and particularly social security and Medicare. These are programs that are funded where you know, uh, older Americans receive benefits uh, that are paid in through taxes on younger Americans. And if there's fewer younger Americans, it makes it, makes it more difficult to fund the system. So that clearly is a potential problem going down the road. Uh, there's also this issue, this issue just in sort of general economic activity. Uh, you know, I don't think it is all that complicated to, to see that like the more people there are, uh, the more economic output there is. Um, but that's not necessarily that interesting in the sense that that could still be just you know, more economic activity, you know, output per person would be the same. What is more interesting is this notion that the more people you have, the greater opportunities there are for creativity and innovation. Um, and that's where you have the potential to sort of you know, significantly improve economic output in a way that improves the well being of lots of people. During the last 30 years, many countries have implemented so called pro natalist policies with the aim of trying to incentivize financially people to have more kids, or to put it another way, to try to make it more economically feasible or less costly for people to have kids. So the types of public policies that are usually talked about when we refer to pro-natalist policies are things like child tax credits or even explicit baby bonuses, government payments to couples that have a newborn, uh, expanded paid family leave or expanded subsidized child care. A number of these policies have been studied, and in general, our read of the evidence is that these policies can potentially lead to some modest increases in birth rates, at least in the short term, but they don't seem to have very large effects. And so that makes us skeptical that incremental policy changes along these lines that might make it you know, less costly for, for a woman or for a couple to have a child we're skeptical that that would really have a substantial impact on the aggregate fertility rate in the U.S. So where does that leave us? Well, we could try to dramatically change society and make it more family friendly and more, you know, feasible for people to combine careers and child raising children and all the other things they want to do um, that may or may not turn fertility rates around. Barring a major turnaround in fertility rates in the U.S., I think you know we're going to have to take dedicated steps to maintain our standard of living in the face of declining fertility, which will lead to a shrinking working age population. What can we do? Well, we can increase immigration and bring in more working age people that way. Um, we can also, and we should also, do more to invest in um, our productive capacity make each person more productive. And that could be accomplished through investments in education, so human capital skill development, as well as technologies, infrastructure, those kind of things to maintain our economic output, our economic growth in the face of a smaller working age population. 